Oh, no, should I? Okay, so you see our unique core system, the planet brain we call it, and you have the planets, the police enforcement, and logistics, the document analysis, what is our application domains, and I will talk about and introduce this little universe to you. We also, when you see in our holodeck, we have the opportunity to go back to the past and into the future, so especially the future will maybe be interesting for us. Let me start We have a team of about 50 uh, experienced engineers and scientists, and of course they have a mission. So the mission is uh, that we all share the passion to create cognitive systems that really understand images and documents and voice. So we will see some nice applications in that area. The team itself it consists on three departments. So we have, um, oh, sorry. So we have um, uh, our main sales and marketing company. It's called Planet Intelligence Systems, already founded 1992. So we do AI since a longer time already. Um, then we have a department called Planet Artificial Intelligence. It's a spin-off of the first one um, to support uh, new new team members coming from the university mainly, from our uh, university in Rostock. And there we have an, another team focusing on research, in total about 40 people. Yeah, as I said, this is, this is a really good team, an alpha team. We won in the last five years almost every competition we participated to be among the first 20 machine learning providers worldwide. So yeah, this is uh, something our team is proud on. Well, that's the team. And now, <laughs> let's start the journey with a little, with a little look back in time. So AI is, as many people think, so it became an academic discipline already in 1950 and uh, Alan Turing is often considered to be a grandfather of AI. Uh, he was a bit a tragic guy, he was also in the Enigma team in, in World War II. But then the first hype of AI began 1956 the golden years of AI um, by Marvin Minsky. It was mainly symbolic AI at that time. Marvin Minsky, he, he announced once he likes to construct an AI what is proud on him, but he failed, he didn't do so. Uh, later, uh, he also was responsible for the AI winter. He uh, wrote his yeah, criticism, so it was kind of enthusiasm and depression later. Uh, that was the time we started. We didn't know much about his uh, criticism or we didn't even care. Then 1997, when uh, Deep Blue um, won in chess against Kasparov, that was considered to be a breakthrough in AI. But in fact, it wasn't because it was still symbolic and rule-based. And uh, uh, just by brute force of the computer systems, they could simply process more or calculate more positions than humans and they never make an easy mistake. Um, then with, with the new millennium we started into the deep learning hype. The, the popular example was ImageNet from the deep convolutional neural networks or here we see the DARPA already 2005. At that time we did a lot of research in the area of recurrent neural networks, what we use now in our new system. I will introduce that later. 
yeah, ImageNet is a popular example, probably you know about it. Then, uh, interesting was 2011, not that long time ago, when yeah, Watson won uh, in the game show Jeopardies. Um, I have some insights and good contacts to the Watson team. It's not that impressive that it was announced. And then, Another m interesting milestone when AlphaGo beats Lee Sedol in the ancient game of Go. Uh, maybe someone know. That's like chess, but has way more positions and it's way more complicated than chess. And if people say, yeah, that's just another milestone, I think that's wrong. I think that's a really tremendous thing because first time ever an AI learned the game from the scratch without human knowledge. So at least the AlphaGo Zero version. And it came up with completely different st strategies. It uh, didn't do the opening and mid-game uh, like, like the humans were considering what is good, how to play the game. And this is due to another learning strategy. And we will address this topic later. So this is already two years ago. So we still have some uh, new systems. And I would like now to introduce one of these new systems to you. Yeah, with the interactive presentations, I'm struggling a little bit. <laughs> yeah, let's take a look at the Planet Brain. It's, it's in fact a sequence-to-sequence -sequence system, while our assumption is that almost everything what we as a human process uh, it it's could be considered as a sequence. So you have an input sequence. Um, I often use the example to explain it. It's like when we humans listen to a story, a fairy tale, like from Little Red Riding Hood, when we read it or our grandfather is telling it, then uh, we have a deep encoding scheme. I don't talk too much about the details. It's like standard convolutional layers and recurrent layers to understand the input sequence, the story, the fairy tale. And then, in, then we create in our own head an abstract meaning representation. So we have in our head an idea, um, what is a wolf, what is a grandmother and the huntsman. Uh, you, can, you can imagine this as a group of neurons they are active when we think about the wolf, another group of neurons. And they are all connected and they form the story in our internal abstract meaning representation. This is important thing, we will need it later. We call it the deep encoding scheme. It's just schematic here, so in the real system it's uh, deeper and bigger. And then we added um, module, what is augmented memory, that means for um, such a thread writing hood, the system needs to have a memory to not only have a representation of what was just said or read at that, that moment, but also to have a representation for the whole story. Another interesting module is the generator, who is able to generate different things. It's the active part of such an artificial brain. It can create some attention. It's also able to create an expectation. So for example, when the grandfather reads the story in a wrong way, that the grandmother has eaten the wolf, the little kid will say, no, no, that was the other way around, because it doesn't fit to the expectation. The attention is important if we like to ask a question later. For example, where should we send the huntsman to shoot the wolf, then to the house of the grandma. So that's, that could be, if we ask a question to the system, could yeah, generate the attention, the attention to certain parts of the memory. Finally, we can create an output sequence with that system. That means we can answer a question or yeah, such a system is used to make a translation also from English to German or Russian to German, for example, or simply to provide a transcription. Looks like, and uh, 
the, this part is the decoding scheme. Such a system is very deep and very big, can be trained from all the way through from the one end to the other end, so we can present the system the input sequence and then later we can present the uh, corresponding output sequence. Such a system is trainable just with uh, yeah, high performance computer systems. We use heavily these GPUs from NVIDIA mainly. This is an example, it's a DGX system, what has eight of these GPU cores. It has a tremendous speed of one petaflop, is 10 up to 15 floating operations per second. And it's approximately four times, 4,000 times faster than a CPU system. To, to train the applications, I will, we, will, we will take a look at later. Even such a system needs a week for, to train the, the system from the scratch. That's why often uh, pre-trained systems will be used. So now I'll, let me introduce some interesting thing. We just got a patent for an, uh, a nice piece of technology. Um, it is if you have such a system already trained, you can for a moment forget about the decoding part uh, and somehow directly access the meaning representation, the abstract meaning representation in the brain. Would be a little bit not so nice if you would do that with a human because you need to open the head and it looks then a bit bloody. But here in our artificial system, we can directly access the internal meaning representation and ask questions. And this is the basic uh, technology for the Argus search um, yeah, product lines, I can, I can like to say. So how does it work? So you might now think, okay, fine, I can directly get information out of the brain, but what does it help me? And uh, for example, if you have, if you, you listen to the sentence, recognize speeches, then you don't exactly know what, what did I say? Did I say the recognize speeches or recognize speeches? Sounds quite similar, but has a completely different meaning. If you are forced to make a transcription from that, yeah, and then you would have made the decision. You, have, you would have decided for yourself, maybe based on the context. Um, is it the blue one or is it the red one? In the case of our perception matrix, we don't need to do so because we have both pathways in the internal meaning representation. So we can enforce the system to uh, give us probability distributions over all possible character channels. Here you see in uh, each column, or each line has, yeah, corresponds to a character channel from the characters A to, <coughs> until Z here. So, and the upper channel, the upper, and each column corresponds to a position in the sequence. Yeah, so if you look at this, you have the red line and the blue, and here you see the W's here and the R over there. So the probabilities or confidences, what the system thinks could be written or spoke, could be spoken there. Well, nice, but what can we do with that? Again. One second.